welcome to Cities on the Front Line. Today we have a fun session on building effective food systems for cities. My name is Francis Gasquier. I'm the practice manager for the urban development and the disaster risk management uh, practice group of the World Bank in the East Asia region. Lauren will introduce our two or three speakers actually in a minute. But before we start, let me, as is now tradition, remind everyone of the intention of this speaker series and the ground rule for the conversation today. The purpose of uh, our global webinars is to have an open and honest learning conversation. So the calls are not on the record and we ask that you not attribute any comments unless you have the person's express permission to do so and we're happy to help you uh, obtain these permissions. We have, uh, as usual, more than 250 people registered for the call today. So to facilitate the discussion, we ask that you use the Q&A function to post questions. Please note that the recording of this session, as well as the PowerPoint presentation and reference material will be posted online uh, on the RCN webpage next Monday. Lauren, over to you. This is really an exciting session, and I'm really looking forward, as I've mentioned, it to uh, digging in. Uh, a few facts to frame our discussion tonight, and these come to us from a Lloyd's Register Foundation risk poll that was taken in 2019. An astounding 60% of people worldwide say that they're worried about the food they eat. What's more, in Southern Africa, in Latin America, and the Caribbean, Harm from food is high, and 26 and 22 percent of people, respectively, had experienced harm from food in the recent past. Interesting for this audience because many of us are working with the public sector. 25 percent of people surveyed in their countries did not trust their governments to provide safe food and water. So tonight, we want to get very serious about understanding and facing the challenges to urban food systems. Presently, they are quite disrupted in many cases by COVID-19 as a pandemic, as well as myriad urbanization and climate change trends. So we're going to hear from three speakers tonight who are going to help us with those issues. And I'm going to introduce them now, and they're going to provide us with some steps and very practical lessons on how we can pursue food policies and investments that foster reliable, inclusive, competitive, and healthy food systems that are aligned with cities' contemporary challenges and aspirations. And just before I introduce the speakers, I want to let you all know that I have a big food system reveal of my own. So stay on the line, and I promise to show it to all of you during the Q&A. So first tonight, we are going to hear from Dr. Gayatri Acharya and Stephen Jaffe. Uh, Dr. Acharya is sector lead for sustainable development in South Asia and lead economist for the agriculture and food global practice of the World Bank with over two decades of operational experience in Africa and Latin America and East and South Asia. She brings a lot to the discussion tonight. Dr. Stephen Jaffe is an agricultural economist with more than 30 years of research policy advice and investment project experience as the World Bank. Like me, he's a recovering development banker and he has worked in multiple regions. Now he's working at the University of Maryland's Agricultural and Resource Economics Department. Dr. Tamara Soma will be our final speaker tonight. She is the research director of the Food Systems Lab at Simon Fraser University at the School of Resource Environment Management. Originally hailing from Indonesia, she conducts research on issues pertaining to food system planning, community-based research, waste management, and the circular economy. So Gayatri and Steve, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very pleased to be here this evening. Thank you for this invitation to the, the Cities of the Frontline series. Very exciting because we, uh, both Steve and I, sort of come from the agriculture family and we really get a chance to <laughs> really interact with, with uh, urban planners and those who might understand much more 
the spaces that we actually spend all our pretty much all our lives in um, in, in, in our uh, line of work and where we live. So uh, looking forward to the discussion today. We started this work on looking at urban food policy about well more than two years ago, actually, and a lot has happened since then, as we all know, right? So we've all had these, you know, we've had to adjust to COVID. We've had to adjust to, to changes in, in uh, how we procure food, where we procure food from. We really, it turned out to be a, a rather fasc fascinating thing in many ways to come to the end of the, the research that we had started on uh, urban food policy uh, and then and then sort of discover that the ground has shifted and so what does this mean? And what it means in, in terms of uh, our research and where we come uh, from into this, this topic is that actually it really under this, these last two years really underline the fact that the performance of urban food systems matters in two very important contexts, which have traditionally not been understood to be interrelated. Could I get the next slide, please? First of all, this performance is really important for the realization of city aspirations. These are aspirations related to job creation, to safety, to resilience, to greenness, and the human, economic, and fiscal health of the spaces, these spaces. In relation to COVID then, well-functioning food systems uh, and, and you know, COVID and, uh, and potentially other types of uh, calamities like this, well-functioning food systems indeed have a role to play, both in terms of future uh, prevention uh, of such outbreaks, as well as in the quick recovery from when such events do take place. Secondly, the importance, uh, the performance of urban food systems is really central to the realization of food system priorities at large. That is on a national scale. And this includes ensuring food and nutritional security, ending hunger and malnutrition, managing animal health, food safety, and environmental risks. Next slide, please. But food, surprisingly, is often a missing ingredient in the many dialogues we have on sustainable or smart cities. Here, for example, we a quick illustration of the multiple areas that are covered by the ASEAN Smart Cities Network and initiative. Food-related challenges and opportunities are hardly mentioned in this framework. And yet, arguably, food matters are important elements of each of these pillars. And for urban economies, jobs, youth, culture, quality of life, this is really centers around food. And if you do a word search for food in any recent uh, in-depth World Bank, ADB, um, uh, other um, development partner, urban development reports for South or Southeast Asia, you will find only a few passing references to food security, but hardly any coverage of how food relates to either the opportunities or the risks faced by cities in these uh, regions. And therefore, in the domain of national uh, agriculture policy, where uh, next slide, please. Uh, from, you know, looking at it from the perspective of, of agriculture policies, in fact, cities are often depict, depicted as elaborate food poles, as passive consumers, um, and, and they are seen as sort of the receiving end of a linear rural to urban food system corridor. In this sort of mental model, cities consume food, but they're not really expected to have much involvement or say in its supply or to be held accountable for food system outcomes, be they related to livelihoods, environmental footprints, national nutritional status, or any other number, any other uh, dimensions of the food system. But in fact, the consumption, distribution, transformation, and production and production of food is very much the business of cities. So as we will try and explain, there is, there is a strong business case for a more forward-looking, multidimensional and inclusive approach to urban food policy and programs that promote um, urban food systems. Next slide, please. This is not some quaint uh, new twist on development dynamics, the details of which you know, can be elucidated by researchers, while planners and policymakers get on with the dimensions of urban 
development which, with which they are much more familiar. In much of emerging Asia, urban growth and high value agriculture are on a collision course, which doesn't bode well for the sustainability of either of these. We see uh, from these satellite uh, images on, on, on your screen, um, how large areas of very fertile agricultural land are being enfolded into urban spaces, especially in the vicinity of larger cities. And this is often an uncontrolled process and it's extending the length of supply chains that are servicing cities with perishable foods in particular and creating a vulnerable built environment as these natural systems are being disrupted. Next, next slide, please. So the health and the resilience of many Asian cities is in fact at risk as these cities of various sizes are growing hotspots for food and nutritional insecurity, for unsafe food, biosecurity risks, for the increased incidence of diet-related non-communicable diseases, such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and for the higher levels of food and food packaging waste, which we are all aware um, as being excessive when we are out uh, um, you know, doing the shopping that we're doing. And if you, if, if you are, ordering in food now as part of the current situation we're in, we realize just how much waste uh, we're generating through this process as well. So these are national issues, but they are gaining prominence in and around cities. And so cities are starting to realize they need to take action. They need to start putting in programs and really do some forward thinking in this. In terms of livelihoods, Another really important, next slide please, another really important place for a uh, space for us to understand as we talk about urban food policy is in fact that informal employment is very significant and food is often the backbone of this informal economy. It's also really critical for um, migrants who are coming into cities. Often the culture of cities is created through the different uh, contributions of these different migrants who are coming into into these urban spaces and so uh, the the food related functions especially related to, to logistics distribution customer service are often really critical uh, for the informal economy and they pose both opportunities as well as challenges so all this to say that essentially we create we we try to think about next slide please we try to think about what this means for South and Southeast Asia in particular. Um, and we, we've, uh, you know, produced this, this, this book looking at uh, some new survey uh, work um, and stakeholder discussions. Actually, Tamara was part of some of those discussions as well. And so these, these uh, presentations will be related in some sense. And uh, we, we've come up with this acronym we call RICH, noting that cities need reliable, inclusive, competitive, and healthy food systems to actually thrive and to grow and to, to change and to become, continue to become, uh, to continue to be places that we want to live in. R stands for reliability. It's the idea that food systems ought to be able to provide stable access, to adequate calories and nutrition to meet the population's needs. It responds closely to basic food security, but it also takes into account elements of resilience. I is for inclusive, it emphasizes the idea that extra care is needed to ensure that the most vulnerable and disenfranchised segments of the population also have their needs met, and that there is room for a diverse set of players in the supply of food. C, competitive, we want food systems to be economically dynamic, we want them to be efficient, we want them to embrace innovation and bring in new players all the time. H then is for healthy, and here it's really important to note that this must encompass human, animal, and environmental health, recognizing their fundamental codependence. So I'm now going to hand over to uh, Steve, who is going to walk us through some of the detailed uh, uh, results from the research that we conducted. Steve? Okay, next slide. Okay, so. Um, this just gives a bit of an overview of what the um, what the book covered, which is really trying to make a business case for action. Um, so we tried to cover the um, 
the sort of why of, of urban food policy, uh, the mega trend shaping uh, food systems as well as uh, urban food system uh, trends, associated risks and, and opportunities. We looked at the status of, of, of what's going on in the region uh, on the basis of a survey, which I'll uh, give a bit, a little bit of detail. Um, we, we then covered sort of what, how cities can do more and we drew upon uh, examples from within the region and, and outside of, of good practice and what may be the comparative advantage of cities in, in some regard to act in this space. And then we came up with sort of an agenda, um, a, a sort of call to action, which was targeted at, at the different audiences that this work is uh, geared toward and that being both sort of urban planners and, and, and leaders, but beyond that also uh, leaders at the national level um, organized private sector, um, NGOs, and uh, development partners and, and researchers. Next slide. So uh, let's take a minute on the, the survey. So we, we carried out a survey uh, in collaboration with uh, the FAO and ICLEI and some other organizations. Um, it was translated into a half dozen languages. Uh, in the end, we, we, we had the uh, Full responses from representatives of 170 cities uh, in 21 countries, um, cutting across East, uh, South, and Southeast Asia. Um, it covered the full spectrum of city sizes. In fact, 40% of the uh, respondents uh, are from cities below 200,000. Uh, plus, on the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, uh, the large and, and, and some of the mega cities uh, of the region. Uh, and we've covered uh, uh, cities that are, are cutting across the sort of low, low income to very high income uh, spectrum. Um, the uh, survey adds a lot to our existing pool of knowledge. Most of the, the existing literature is, is based on um, case studies, typically of larger cities or cities that are sort of more advanced uh, in, in food engagement. Um, and uh, that literature tends to be focused on cities who, that are members of uh, what's called the Milan Urban Food Pact, which was an initiative started several years ago, really about cities making commitments to mainstream food security um, and uh, other food matters into their, uh, their, their vision and their, their ongoing planning. Of the 200 uh, signatories of, of the Milan Urban Food Pact, uh, only about 10 are in. Uh, emerging Asia uh, and, and actually zero in um, Southeast Asia. Um, so next slide. So uh, one of the things we did, we, we, in, the, in the survey, we were looking at, uh, we were looking at perceptions of opportunities and constraints, and we were uh, looking at the sort of mapping of initiatives, uh, assessment work that's done, uh, programs, policies, um, and we did sort of gathered sort of the portfolio which cities have uh, ongoing, um, whether they initiated it or it, it was sort of their application of national uh, approaches. And this uh, graph just shows uh, we broke it down here by uh, the six countries, uh, and we're comparing here about a dozen different um, sort of engagement areas at the production end, at the market end, uh, and at the consumer end and shows uh, quite a bit of variability and just a few highlights the details of which are are in the uh, in the book but um, cities tend to engage much more at the production end than at the uh, consumer end of the food system which is a bit ironic given the prevailing sort of mental model of of cities primarily as, as consumption centers um, we found that sort of involvement on sort of more inclusive uh, food system uh, um, initiatives uh, are, are extremely rare in, in small and medium cities. Um, things like, you know, soup kitchens and, and uh, um, food banks and things like that. Um, uh, so it tend to be only in the sort of larger cities. Um, we found contrast really across uh, city size, uh, income categories, and, and particularly across countries, which suggests that um, a lot of the dynamic here has to do with the, the enabling environment that's provided by national guidance and regulation. Um, now, doing this sort of inventory is was sort of necessary, but not particularly interesting in a sort of strategic sense. Um, so we really needed to 
try to dig deeper and discern patterns and try to explain the patterns that, that we saw. Um, next slide. So to do that, we needed really a conceptual framework. So based on our reading of the literature, we, we determined that a, a smart approach to uh, food policy engagement by cities has three, three dimensions. One, that it's, it's proactive or it's forward looking and it's sort of it's anticipating future problems and opportunities. Secondly, that it's, it's integrative, meaning that it's holistic and multi-sectoral. In, in scope. And third, that it's inclusive. So it involves many stakeholders and addresses the, the needs of the entire you know, population, including poor and vulnerable uh, population. So we drew upon many of the results of the survey and we um, classified these sort of assessments, programs, and policies, whether they are indicative of a, a proactive, a integrative, and or in inclusive approach. And from that, we sort of came up with an index. So the cities were able to be scored uh, according to these uh, dimensions. And then when we add up those three dimensions, we then uh, ended up with a, a classification uh, system of, of cities. Um, so the cities that uh, uh, scored high across these all three of these parameters, we, we end up calling them, uh, they're applying a food smart approach. Uh, to, to addressing uh, emerging risks and opportunities. On the other end of the spectrum are cities that are really just firefighting. They're reacting to uh, events, uh, problems typically, uh, and not, uh, and, and, and not um, acting in a, in a forward-looking manner. We, we call them reactive food cities. Um, one step up from that, you begin to get uh, proactivity on certain topics. Um, yet still not uh, uh, very sort of integrative in the approach. Uh, we call them engaged cities and a step above that um, are, are more proactive and uh, cities that are further along on this, uh, this journey, but uh, not yet at, uh, anywhere near the frontier compared to the, um, what we call food smart cities. Next slide. So what, what are the results? Um, here we have uh, summarized two graphs, uh, two uh, graphs in this slide. The top one includes um, some of the lead or capital cities, and it shows their scores on our three dimensions. Uh, and the bottom one is the uh, classification according to city size across the, the whole sample. Um, and uh, we basically found only 8% of our uh, sample to to fit in this sort of category of applying a food smart approach. Um, slightly less than 20% or sort of the, the step down from that, the progressive stage, which means that almost three fourths of the uh, cities in the survey are at a fairly early stage of uh, food policy engagement. On the one hand, this surprised us given that um, Asian, the prominence of Asian cities in many global dialogues and initiatives on, on smart cities and governance and innovation. On the other hand, the, the minimal involvement of Asian cities in these global uh, urban food networks um, provided a, a bit of a hint of what we might find here uh, in this survey. Um, the, uh, we did expect the smaller cities to be lagging uh, in, in this. And, and indeed, 90% of the uh, cities below uh, 200,000 are at very early stages of, of food policy engagement. Um, you get into sort of the medium um, uh, medium scale, it's very var very varied um, uh, patterns that, that need to be explained. And then uh, uh, interesting for the capital cities, um, you know, some of the capital cities in, in the region are at the bottom 10 or 15% of our sample and some are at, are at the top end of the sample. So. Um, not all capital cities are on the front lines on this topic. Next slide. So uh, a big chunk of the book actually deals with uh, what's on the menu, uh, how cities can do better. Um, and, um, and so how they can leverage the, the resources they have, the mandates that they have in, in, in better ways. And we drew upon examples uh, uh, global and, and uh, regional examples. And it's broken up into four sections. So we look at, uh, we look at agriculture and land use. So we're covering there 
uh, things like uh, cropland protection, um, um, land use zoning, uh, promotion of sort of sustainable uh, cultural practices, ag innovation. Um, we look at marketing, uh, so that's on logistics, uh, food safety, street food vending, e-commerce, um, uh, branding, uh, usually around also with tourism. Um, we look at consumer end uh, initiatives on uh, wellness programs, uh, use of institutional food procurement and, and other areas. And then we look at sort of the overarching uh, framing and um, management of, of the food policy, the sort of governance structure, the institutional arrangements. Um, so basically, the, uh, this looks at sort of the tools uh, and the um, available to, to cities. Next slide. So the book, while the book offers a lot of examples, um, we make clear there's no single blueprint or, or recipe for cities to follow. Right? What can be tackled, how it can be done, it's going to it's going to vary by by context and the capabilities and the mandates that cities have. Um, uh, this is a field that you know we we say this is a field with a starting line with with multiple stages, but no real finish line. Uh, and that's because even cities applying what we call a smarter approach today are still have work to do because the challenges of the food system, the opportunities that are going to emerge and society's expectations of what food needs to deliver and not deliver, those are changing over time. So the, the food smart cities still have uh, work to do. There's, there's a growing body of international experience in this field. Um, yet much of what's documented comes from high income countries or from large cities. Um, and the applicability of some of that um, uh, may be limited in, 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 in some contexts in the region, not only in this region, but in other uh, developing country regions. And so Asian cities are going to partly have to learn by doing and by sharing their, their own experiences uh, with one another. Next slide. Regardless of the size, cities really need to approach this topic strategically. Now, that doesn't mean that you, 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 you can or need to come up with your, your strategic plan up front that has, lays out detailed governance structure and, and uh, you know, implementation sequencing and all that. That's, that's rarely what happens. Um, from from experience, it's it, rather than going sort of from vision to action, the more common um, sequence is going from action to vision, where cities are sort of getting into this topic on certain uh, high profile uh, uh, themes and and the experience and the the coalitions that are formed from that and the learning process then forms a, a, a basis for moving on to. Uh, the next uh, issues and eventually the sort of formalization uh, of the approach. Next slide. Of course, I mean, we're talking here like cities, like they're, 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 they're actors. Of course, cities are a collection of stakeholders. Um, and to move the agenda forward, we, we lay out sort of calls to action from, from, uh, from multiple uh, distinct groups and that being the sort of city leaders, um, urban planners, uh, the national uh, technical uh, ministries and other national agencies, uh, large food companies and industry associations, chambers of commerce, civil society, um, academic institutions, and and development partners. Um, so clearly, for moving uh, moving this agenda forward from from action to to vision and then to action, um, while there's no unique recipe. Uh, we need to involve multiple chefs. Next slide. So, thank you very much. Um, the, uh, if you do a search under uh, Rich Food Smart City online, you can find uh, the book. And here's also the link. Uh, you can uh, type in that link and you'll find uh, the document. Thank you very much. Move to Tamara.
Okay, are we ready? Go ahead, Tamara, we can see your slides. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Gayatri and Stephen, for such an excellent presentation. Um, and as an urban planner myself, I'm very, very happy to hear the call out for urban planners to take action on food. Um, also, greetings to all of the audience and organizers today. Thank you so much for attending this presentation. So today, I'm very excited to highlight four key ingredients for planning resilient urban food systems. Um, and so let's start the presentation now. Uh, next slide, please. Perfect. So on our menu today, I will briefly talk about the conceptual framework of distancing. I will then start the appetizer course with justice because the appetizer course basically serves as the direction of the meal. Um, this will then be followed by the main course where we will collectively break institutional silos to promote a, a food systems approach, followed by my favorite, the dessert, where we will be closing the loop and promoting circularity. And then we'll go out for a walk after our meal. And I will briefly explain the role of a food system planner in helping action and implementing all of this. Okay, next slide, please. According to Potakuchi and Kaufman, food is a chain of activities that connects food production, processing, distribution, consumption, and waste management, as well as all of the related regulatory institutions and activities. But not all food systems are designed equal. Some food systems are extremely complicated. Some are unjust. Some are direct and very short. And some are impacted by multiple trade regulations that are too confusing for the everyday people to understand. Next slide. In this case, it is apt, I believe, to introduce the audience to the concept of distancing. So according to Princeton, distancing is the separation between primary resource extraction decisions and ultimate consumption decisions occurring along four dimensions, which is geography, culture, bargaining power, and agency. So at one extreme, we have the zero distance, which is uh, production and consumption by one household or individual. For example, a home garden, right? So that's zero distance. At the other extreme, is a global cross-cultural and among agents of disparate abilities and alternatives. So I would argue that the model of rapid urbanization that we see in many cities, uh, especially in Asia, like in my home country of Indonesia, is a form of distancing. So according to Princeton, the greater the distancing on any of the several dimensions, whether it be geography, power, agency, then the greater likelihood that ecological feedback will be severed and resource overused. To simplify, distancing's power in obfuscating, um, obfuscating the system makes it easier to waste, to exploit, and to harm. And there are two relevant aspects of distancing, spatial distancing and mental distancing. Next slide, please. So spatial distancing has to do with the actual geographical distancing. Um, so that's geography and also urban planning and development. So I would like to share a quote from a low income respondent um, in my study in the city of Bogor, which is a city south of the, the capital of Jakarta. Um, and so this illustrate uh, her spatial distancing to food sources due to urban development. So as Ayu told me, and Ayu is a low income um, re resident, uh, she said, before I used to grow cassava, bananas, corn. Now the land has been used to build those big houses. Near my house, there used to be trees, rambutan tree, banana trees, cassava, different types. There were some folks who planted spinach, tomatoes, and other vegetables. When we needed food, we just picked it. Now it's so difficult. So this quote highlights a process of distancing often felt by low-income community members who now lack space to grow food and must rely, um, therefore, on purchasing their food. Another example of spatial distancing is the fact that Douglas Rasugu, for example, a farmer in Kenya, has to waste 60% of his French beans because it does not meet the aesthetic standards of supermarkets and consumers in the West. So in this case, decisions made very, very far away creates a trail of resource wastage um, in another country. Next slide. And spatial distancing also contributes to what's called mental distancing. So while we all now have, uh, you know, Zoom or WebEx in this case, so we can be somewhat connected despite the spatial distance, when it comes to food, this is a different story. 
distancing results in diminished accountability and responsibility on the part of the consumers, retailers, and producers. So we can reflect on how urban citizens, particularly in Asia, interact with food differently in different retail mo models, from traditional wet markets to mo mobile vegetable vendors to modern supermarkets. In a study by Natawijaya et al. in Indonesia, it was found that 60% of fruits and vegetables in modern supermarkets in Indonesia are actually imported. Think about that in the context of Indonesia being a country that can grow hundreds of types of tropical fruit all year round. In modern supermarkets, food are also heavily packaged, especially for branding, which results in more waste issues. And Gayatri mentioned about the food packaging issues. And there's also a level of anonymity and a lack of connection to the vendors and the farmers. And this anonymity and a lack of connection results in issues like this. Um, in the slide, you can see meat being discarded by a customer in a supermarket in the candy aisle just because they decided they didn't want it anymore. So they didn't bother to go back to the meat section. Um, and so it's this kind of disconnect and that's called mental distancing. Next slide. So taking all of this into account, I want to tap into the work uh, of Gayatri, Stephen, and colleagues in their excellent book, Rich uh, Food, Smart City, on the three benchmarking criteria of food policy engagement. And in my presentation, I will show you some examples of these categories in action, uh, both in Canadian cities, uh, in a Canadian city and in an Indonesian city. Um, and the first category is proactive or urban food work that is forward looking to future problems or opportunities. The second one is integrative or urban food work that is multi sectoral in scope and involves coordination. And then the third category is inclusive or urban food work that gives priority to those disadvantaged and vulnerable. Okay, next slide. So now let's start with the appetizer course. So if there were a key ingredients to develop urban food resiliency, the first one, which I call the appetizer, would be justice and inclusivity. It, it really, um, I call this the appetizer because it sets the direction of the meal. It has to come first and not as an afterthought. So in my work in the city of Vancouver, I've been um, uh, privileged to play a role in uh, various food-related municipal initiatives to promote urban food security and resiliency. And my team uh, and I at the Food Systems Lab, we do this by centering the voices of equity-deserving communities first and foremost. So who are these communities who are the most excluded in Vancouver? So in Vancouver, one in three indigenous children live in poverty and one in five recent immigrant households face food insecurity. And while we have a lot of food banks um, here, 62% of urban residents that use food banks know that the amount of food that is given is insufficient to meet their daily household food needs. So um, I've collaborated with the Vancouver Park Board in taking equity into account and considering that it stewards a lot of land in the city um, they, uh, as a park board, seek to contribute to food, food security. And uh, this is just an example of their current master plan. I did not, I was not involved in this particular master plan, but it clearly puts equity and inclusivity front and center. So I, wanted, I want to share that with you. Next, please. Oh, there's the missing slide. Okay, that's fine. Um, so, yes, that's fine. Uh, perfect. So as noted in the plan, um, you know, it's, it's not about just only asking who is not at the table, but also asking why are they not at the table and how can we ensure their presence at the table. So instead of the typical model of planning consultation, which is often um, inaccessible and not actually engaging the targeted community, when we as a team engage communities in the city, uh, we, for example, can support the creation of community advisory council composed of the target communities. We can ensure that there is an honorarium process to recognize communities' time and expertise, or else they already face many barriers to attend these uh, types of consultation in urban policymaking. And we also apply alternative approaches to facilitation, such as sharing circles rather than large town halls. And this really disrupts the traditional bureaucratic approach, which uh, serves as barriers to many low income um, and diverse communities um, who would otherwise not attend um, the, the typical planning town hall approach. Next, please. Perfect. So we also engage communities through building relationship and trust. So as a planner, uh, when we do engagement with communities, particularly around food issue, um, you know, we share this commitment 
Um, and so um, my team and I would talk with the communities and we would tell them that we commit to listening, we commit to learning and centering the perspectives and voices, particularly in the context of Vancouver, uh, the host nation, which is the Musqueam, the Squamish and the tsleil First Nation. And we ensure that we intend to do food work in a good way. Um, valuing honesty, accountability, and humility at every step of the way. And I think this is really important, particularly in the context of the city of, of Vancouver, because planners um, in, in many cases have actually done harm um, by uh, in, in the way that it, uh, with urban development and the design of the city. Um, and so therefore it's important to rebuild trust and rebuild the relationship with planners, especially when it comes to engaging in food matters. Uh, next slide, please. And the next course is the main course, and this uh, ties into the integrative component of uh, Guy, uh, Gayatri and Stephen um, and colleagues' book, uh, Rich uh, City. So um, I argue that basically to truly promote resiliency, we need a systems approach. And as someone who is deeply involved in tackling food, uh, food, uh, food waste issues in urban centers, this one is a very, very important issue that needs to be addressed systematically since it uh, tackles the environment, economy, culture, technology, and more. Um, and it's also known as the wicked problem. Unfortunately, when we think of often tackling about food waste solution, often the solution is far from systemic. Uh, rather, they create more problems. So they're incremental solutions that create more problems and externalities. For example, trying to solve food waste by extending the shelf life of banana by wrapping it up individually in plastic. That's just one example. Or solve, trying to solve food waste by simply moving unwanted corporate food waste to food banks to feed the poor as if this will solve the entire problem of poverty. Um, or, and, and it does not obviously address the root causes of food waste. Um, next slide, please. So starting first in the city of Toronto, um, we wanted to actually address the urban food waste issue through a systems approach. And we did this by engaging um, uh, stakeholders in a social innovation lab process. So at the core of our approach is that we sought solutions that took into account root causes, root causes of the problem instead of just offering incremental solutions. Next slide, please. And social innovation labs are basically multi-stakeholder platforms. And so the idea is that to the best of one's ability, um, you want to make sure that you bring together diverse individuals and organizations to reflect the microcosm of the system. So even though we were trying to tackle urban food waste in Toronto, we brought stakeholders in from the greater Toronto area and, and, and in the province too. So the stakeholders included um, were farmers, both rural farmers and urban farmers, food businesses, indigenous leaders, migrant farm workers, uh, consumers, food bank recipients, um, schools, associations, civil society groups, faith organizations, uh, local government, provincial government, federal government, like basically the whole entire microcosm. And we held multiple workshops from systems mapping to prototyping to collaborate on ideas together. Next slide, please. So I found that um, our team found that the one of the most powerful antidote to the distancing process is the building of relationships. It's a process whereby different sector stakeholders and players learn how each action from each sector impacted one another. And relationship building is also a way to build empathy between stakeholders with very, very, very different priorities. A major breakthrough um, from the group was an acknowledgement, you know, that the indigenous principles and practices in Canada that were already existing for millennia uh, are actually key to shifting values around food. And that principle is the principle of all my relations. Okay, next slide, please. Now, this is my favorite for dessert. Okay, so um, there's nothing better for dessert than I would argue closing the loop. And what good is it for us to grow food sustainably and everything if it is only going to be wasted away anyway? So this visual here was developed through the whole lab social innovation process that I shared because when we think of preventing or reducing food loss and waste, we're, we actually are thinking about a transformation in values. And one value that I grew up with being born and raised in Indonesia is that I must eat every single grain of rice or else the rice will cry. And obviously the saying is symbolic, but it does represent the need to appreciate the hard work of farmers. Next slide, please. 
So currently I'm working on a food loss and waste research project with the United Nations Environmental Program, the International Institute for Environment and Development, and the government of Indonesia under the UN Partnership for Action on Green Economy. Um, and you know, at last, uh, with, this, uh, with distancing, nutrition transition, the industrialization of agriculture and supermarket revolution, Indonesia um, is now considered a significant generator of food loss and waste. And it is estimated that anywhere between 115 to 184 uh, kilogram per capita per year of food loss and waste um, is generated in Indonesia, contributing to 7.29% of GHG emissions per year. And the amount of food that is lost and wasted in Indonesia can feed 61 to 125 uh, million people. Next slide, please. But reducing food waste is not only the issue. With the rise of plastic packaging, managing food waste on site in cities has been made even more difficult due to contamination with plastic waste. So this is another form of distancing. So despite Indonesian laws that state that producer must take responsibility for managing packaging or goods that are difficult to decompose, this policy is very difficult uh, to implement in such large uh, cities and with a, a lot of population. Um, as one of the respondents from my study noted that in the 1980s, waste was easy to manage because it was all biodegradable, banana leaves as packaging, palm leaf as packaging, and so everything can just be buried. But now there is so much plastic waste that one cannot rely on on-site waste management anymore and must rely on municipal waste collection. So to promote urban resiliency, we need to also consider packaging waste, particularly in light of often very poor waste infrastructure in many areas of urban Asia. Next slide, please. So when it comes to the proactive side, um, you know, in the city of Bandung, Indonesia, the municipal government has started an integrated urban farming program to try to promote that closed loop urban food system and also address the waste issue. So the Buruan Sae Integrated Urban Agriculture Program promotes local food production and also closing the loop through the return of nutrients from the composting process. And the program was actually recognized by the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact as an example of a good food governance. Um, however, there's still some ways to go when it comes to scaling up these types of programs, particularly around compost utilization and also investing in the, in the business side of integrated urban agriculture. Okay, next slide. Okay, and so this is the part where after all of our meal, I will take you on a walk so we can digest our food. Um, because now we need the action piece. And this is where I want to mention the growing importance of the role of food systems planners. And I am a food system planner. So um, I train my students in the planning program at Simon Fraser University, um, you know, as a food system planner. And the, 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 the pl planners, uh, food system planner are planners who integrate um, or are engaged with the food system with the aim of rendering it more sustainable with respect to its social, economic, and ecological effects. Um, and in terms of the skill set and values, you know, they are trained to help bring community together around food, to solve issues from a system plan, to plan for more food secure and resilient cities, and to tackle food related issues with justice at the core. And so I look forward to seeing more planners and city builders in urban Asia who are deeply engaged, just like I am, um, in developing a more sustainable and just food system for all. And I sincerely thank Gayatri, Stephen, and colleagues for such an excellent book that will hopefully spark that process and um, that I will use for uh, teaching my students as well. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tamara. What a rich presentation, and you, you managed to really show the interlinkages and intricacies of so many uh, aspects of, of um, food systems. And at the end, I think your argument linking it to how much GHG emission food waste generates and how much waste, and particularly plastic waste. And finally, how many, how many people could be fed if we were to waste a little bit less food, I think these are extremely strong argument to try to really reflect and improve um, improve the overall system. In fact, uh, quite a few people have pointed out in the chat section that the second SDG, and I personally think it should be first SDG, uh, is zero hunger. It's actually eliminate, eliminating hunger around the world, which is something that's eminently feasible and that we should all aspire to. Uh, 
we don't have much time for question. Um, and so I, there's, there's so many things that could be asked, but there's something that I wanted to start with Stephen because it's something that Stephen said that really uh, struck me. Uh, Steve, you say that uh, small and medium cities, are, it's extremely rare to find actually actual strategies or even programs being implemented in these cities. And even big cities, you often implement program only because they want to satisfy or they want to align with, uh, with national policies. Could you, Steve, elaborate a little bit on, on what, what are these national policies that a, a government, a national government or a provincial government can put in place to try to encourage cities to be more proactive on this food system uh, agenda. And then, I, I don't know if, if um, Gayatri or Tamara, you wanna add to this, but I'd like to have your perspective more on the city side, what policies can a city put in place to encourage communities uh, to be, be, be be more proactive. And then finally, Tamara, you, you mentioned something that struck a chord. You said that urban planners have often done a lot to arm food systems, uh, but that there are things they can do to improve on it. So maybe you can also elaborate on that. So let's go from Stephen to Gayatri to Tamara. Uh, and all of this in less than 10 minutes. So okay. Yeah, don't think you have to give all the answers because yeah. otherwise we, we can be there. All night, which would be great, but I think no, the, no, the, some of us. these are good questions. So look, the first thing at the national level is 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 on measurement, right? Our our data are pretty bad in terms of spatially disaggregated data on a lot of matters on, on food. And so even when you get sort of rural urban, you don't really get the distinction by city size or anything else. So the, the tools that cities the, the, the data that cities might have available to them in terms of the nature of the, the problem or the distance they are from, from better practice or whatever um, is a bit limited. So there's a statistical angle on this. Um, national governments play important roles in, in either enabling or disenabling city action. Um, and part of the enabling is, is really on the sort of the regulatory framework for things like, for example, protecting um, peri-urban cropland. Um, uh, there are countries that have sort of national guidance and regulations on this and, and, um, and others that don't. And where there, there is, you, you tend to get, um, uh, you, you have then the, the framework for cities to utilize to, to use whatever tools that they have, whether it's zoning or, or incentives or something else. Um, National governments can provide technical guidance in areas like on, on, on food safety, biosecurity, which allows, you know, uh, enable cities to, to know sort of what, what constitutes good principles and practice and whatever, and not just leaving cities to sort of figure it, figure it out themselves. So there's a lot on the sort of national plans, things like wholesale market uh, plans at a national level. So you're not getting duplicative investment. So there are things that, that national governments can do to give a framework, to give um, a guidance for cities um, on, on a part of decentralization to empower cities to take up uh, certain mandates, but also to support their capacity development to do it. It's, it's one thing to delegate, but, but you know, things like food safety, we tend to see um, a very limited sort of trained cadre at local levels to do it. So that's gotta be part of national um, um, human capital development in the field. So in addition to giving the mandate and, and partly the resources to do it, it's, it's strengthening capacity. So some, some, some areas uh, um, and some countries seem to be doing it better than others. Thank you, Steve. Gayatri, another thing that struck me in the presentation is uh, I don't know if it was you or Stephen who said that very often in cities, programs are developed not from vision to action, but from action to vision, which I think is a very interesting approach uh, and probably the way cities could, could uh, uh, start program. But you, you may have particular views, so over to you. Yes, no, uh, thanks very much. Uh, 
I really uh, loved uh, Tamara's presentation because it gave, it gave so much more granularity to some of the work that uh, uh, many cities are trying to do exactly uh, to that point, Francis, of finding those entry points, finding a way to start pushing the boundaries. Just to reflect back a little bit on what Steve was saying, I think the, the national, one of the great ways in which national governments can really influence this is because many countries have national programs that actually finance things like, you know, they sort of top up smart city initiatives. They provide some sort of incentive um, in especially, let's say federal countries, states will get certain amounts of money or cities in certain states will get certain amounts of money in addition to whatever uh, revenues that they themselves may be generating. I think that could be a great influencer for really raising the bar on bringing together what are these, what these national aspirations are for a country and the local aspirations, the city aspirations, which is where all of these action oriented pieces need to come in. Those entry points that can that can help get you closer to a tipping point where you can, in fact, start to pull together that vision for your city. I think a lot of cities have started this. So uh, uh, managing your agriculture lands, for example, is a city mandate uh, and, you know, thinking constructively about uh, empty spaces within cities that may be underutilized to, to start to re, rethink them as uh, agriculture spaces. That's a city initiative. And all of that can be incentivized by national policies. They can showcase, they can, you know, you can have city to city learning. Some cities are really good at managing street vendors and other cities are horrendous at it. And so, you know, you really have a lot of space there to to already start to uh, improve the action uh, entry points so that that visioning can start. Thanks. Thank you, Gayatri. Amara, you, you, you were the most, uh, you were very inspiring, I must say. So you get the last word uh, and then Lauren will close. <laughs> Oh, no, 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 no. I'm definitely not. Um, uh, give, give us that, you know, after dessert, there's always a little. Oh, are we going for a walk now? Okay. Right. Um, We're going for a praline or something that um, uh, a cherry on the cake. Yes, the gelato on the cake. Um, that's great. I, I, I think that right now um, is, is the right time, especially to push um, the agenda around food. A lot of cities have realized with a COVID pandemic, particularly that we can't just put um, food to the side, right? As Gayatri and Stephen noted, you know, food has not been a big part of the conversation in cities because it's just kind of been put just to the market. But instead, this actually needs to be policy. And so this is why I think one of the biggest contribution of the uh, the Rich City um, book is the business case um, and the, the business case to actually invest in food. Um, because a lot of these programs, like as I mentioned in the city of Bandung with the integrated urban agriculture program, they actually need help to scale up the closed loop food system. You know, they've made the compost, but now what? Now, how can we market this compost, you know? Um, and so that is the next step. Um, in, in Canada right now, we have farmland preservation policies, but without the economic development policy coupled with the farmland preservation policy, you're just preserving farmland and the farmers themselves um, may have difficulties to actually make ends meet. So everything needs to be connected. And I think this book is a really great start. And so I'm, I'm really looking forward to um, all of us globally collaborating on making all of these urban cities uh, food secure, resilient, and just. Thank you, Tamara. <laughs> you, Lauren. Thank you, Francis. And I, I just wanted to thank our speakers again. Thank you to Gayatri. Thank you to Steve. And thank you to you, Tamara. That was truly an extensive menu. Um, so there's no real way to summarize it. But I think what you've shown us all is that we can contribute at various stages, no matter where a city is, to the kinds of recipes that will get us there. And I promised to show you my contribution, which is very new. So I've just become an urban farmer this week. So these are my these are my grow bricks, which are my Legos of urban agriculture, and we don't have time to talk about it now, but I'm very excited about them and I'll, I'll post more on my social media. Um, but I again wanted to say thank you. This is such a critical issue and 
food security was really an issue, especially for children, for vulnerable communities during COVID-19. And so we have to keep this issue central to the agenda. This is the second cities on the front line we've spoken about food systems, and we will continue to raise this issue. So I hope that all three of you will stay engaged with us. And if there are follow up from the cities, from those who are on the line today, we'll be sure to connect you. So again, thank you so much for your contributions. It's been a truly inspiring session. Um, the next session will be in two weeks time and it will be about specific private sector interventions for urban resilience. So I hope that all of you will come back and join us again. So uh, from me in Singapore, on behalf of Resilient Cities Network and our partners at the World Bank, Thank you so, so much for joining us and we'll see you again soon. Good night. Good night, good day everyone.